Hey guys, welcome back. I'm Macon Campbell and this is Macon Stuff. So today I'm once again going to try something that I've never done before which is making a salt and pepper grinder or a mill and I'm looking forward to getting into this project I think it's going to be really fun so before I get started just let me give you a little bit of a backstory on why it is that I'm doing this it's a bit of a deep story but I'll try and keep it as short as possible but if you'd like to skip it I'll leave a timestamp below here so you can skip to where we get into the action so the making of these mills is completely inspired by my late father-in-law his name was Wilkin Pote. As I sit here recording this video, I find myself reminded of something that I heard recently. Um, now I can't remember exactly where I heard it, but it goes something like this. Every person dies twice. The first time when you actually die, and uh, then again the last time someone says your name out loud. So in some kind of way, I'm hoping that uh, this video and every single time someone plays this video, somehow he gets to live a little bit longer. So anyway, let's get back to the video. And he made and sold quite a number of these. Um, this right here is uh, one example of a pepper mill that he made. This one was gifted to his daughter, my wife, probably around four or five years ago. Now, unfortunately, just over two years ago, my father-in-law was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer and he was only given about four to six months to live. Now, that estimate was even more than what he ended up getting and in fact, he passed away tragically about three months later. Now, my father-in-law and I didn't always see eye to eye, but uh, one thing that we did have in common was woodworking and making things in general. Now, shortly before he passed away, he invited me into his workshop one day to uh, share with me the art of making these pepper grinders. So he gave me a brief description on how he made them and he also showed me a couple of tools that he made himself in order to facilitate in the making of these, um, some of which I'll show you a little bit later. And before we finished up, he showed me this box. Now this box, as you can see, is almost full with mechanisms used to make these grinders. And knowing that he was going to pass away soon, I'm guessing that he just didn't want these to go to waste and he was hoping that uh, I may go ahead and make a bunch of these in the future um, after he's gone. So that is basically the story of how I came about this box of uh, grinder mechanisms and why I'm going to be making a set of these today. So a little bit about these mechanisms. Uh, these are called Crush Grind and this is a Danish company. Now, from what I can tell, this is the Rolls-Royce of grinder mechanisms. It has a ceramic grinding chamber and each and every one of these carries a 25 year guarantee on the mechanism itself. Now, there are two different types. Um, there is this one with the shaft and then there is a, another one uh, without a shaft. Um, the construction on this one is a little bit different, but today I'm going to be making one uh, with a shaft. This box does contain three different shaft sizes, but the long ones you can still cut to whatever size uh, you'd like to use. So a couple of days ago, I went up on the website and I downloaded these images. These are the two different grinder mechanisms and these diagrams basically give you a blueprint of how these things need to be made and put together. Now the basic idea that I had was to use a light wood for the body and then a dark wood for the top and then for the other one switch it around using a dark wood for the body and a light wood for the top. For the dark wood I'm going to be using teak and for the light wood I managed to find a couple of offcuts of uh, maple and beech. Um, decided which one I'm going to use yet. Now my hope was to make the body and the head out of a single piece of wood but unfortunately I couldn't find any wood that was thick enough that would allow me to do that. Um, as you can see on this one that my father-in-law made um, he also had to join two pieces of wood together in order to get enough thickness to make this. So seeing that I'm going to have to um, cut and join some wood in order to make these, I came up with a different design which I think is going to look really nice. I'm going to take the teak and I'm going to sandwich a piece of maple in between and for the other one I'm going to take the maple and sandwich a piece of teak in between. And I really think that's going to look nice. Um, so in terms of the design, 
um, this morning I sat down quickly and I drew up this design. As you can see, it's slightly different uh, to this one. The main difference is basically in the cap. I wanted to make a round cap. As you can see on this one, my father-in-law turned a tenon onto the head, which fits into this mortise in the body. So mine is basically going to be the opposite of that. I'm going to thin down the top of the body as much as I can, and I'm going to try and make the cap fit over that. Now, this is basically just a guideline. This is not concrete. Um, as I start making it, I might make some changes to it, but this is drawn up to scale so I can use this to help me flush out all of the shapes that I need for this mill. So with all that said, the first thing we have to do is cut and mill up some wood and get the blanks glued up so I can get ready to start turning. So let's do it. Okay, so this is me trying to pretend like I haven't already picked out the pieces of wood that I'm going to use for this project and conveniently left them at the top. So in the design that I drew up, the height of these pieces was about 180 millimeters. Um, so I'm measuring these pieces to about 250 millimeters just so that I can make sure that I have enough material to work with. The widest part of my design is roughly 60 millimeters. So I'm cutting all of my pieces here to 70 millimeters so that I can end up with uh, 70 by 70 millimeter blanks. So the piece I'm going to sandwich in the middle, I want to be roughly 10 millimeters thick. I'm cutting all of these to about 15 millimeters so that when I plane both sides of them, I can end up with roughly 10 millimeters. Okay, so all the pieces are cut now, so now I have to plane or joint them so that I can get a good bond between all of the pieces. So the width of the blade on my hand planer is about 80 millimeters wide, so I thought that would be perfect for jointing these pieces. But unfortunately it seems like my blades are a little bit worn and they've got a slight concave to them, uh, leaving the finish on my pieces with a slight convex. So when I go to put the pieces together, the ends were not flush. So as the joints between my pieces weren't uh, perfectly flat, uh, I was hoping that by using the belt sander I could true them up. But in the end it seems I was just accentuating the problem and at the end of the day I had no choice but to bring out the big planer. And in hindsight I guess I should have just done that from the start. So now the joints are nice and flush, uh, now I guess we can glue them up.
So seeing as these pieces are going to be chucked up in the lathe, it's a good idea to trim off the ends so that they are perfectly flat and square. Okay, so next I'm going to take these, uh, chuck them up between centers and then turn them down into rough cylinders uh, that I can start working with. But before we do that, I just quickly want to run through the internals of this mill and how I'm going to go about making it. Okay, so as you can see, uh, according to the instructions here, in order to create all of the steps and holes uh, for the internals of this mill, you need a 22 millimeter, a 38 millimeter, and then also a 42 millimeter. Now, I wasn't able to find a 42 millimeter, so I went and bought this adjustable auger bit. I gave it a test and I was struggling with it quite a bit uh, because it only has a cutting edge on one side. It was producing a whole lot of chatter and I wasn't getting really clean cuts. But that's what I have and that is what I was planning on working with. And now the proper way to construct this is to create these uh, indents or recesses um, over here which are for these little tabs um, on the grinding mechanism and on the head. These need to be pressed in here and then those tabs lock in place into these recesses. Now between my father-in-law's stuff I managed to find um, these tools. Um, as you can see this one was used to create this recess over here and uh, this one over here was used to create the recess at the bottom here. Now I have in the meantime watched a number of other videos of people making mills with uh, this particular grinding mechanism and I've noticed that a lot of them ignore this step and what they do is cut these tabs off and then they epoxy these mechanisms in place and I think that might be uh, the better option for me. So after looking through a couple of things that I took out of my father-in-law's workshop I managed to find this piece over here and from what I can tell this is a tool that he had made specifically for the purposes of boring out this part. This top part of here measures to about 38 and this part of here to about 42 and uh, as you can see there is a indent cut into the tool over here and I'm guessing that is exactly the depth at which it has to be bored out. So once I've got the body turned down to the rough dimensions I'm going to do a through hole from each side so that they meet up nicely in the middle and then once I've decided which side is going to be the bottom I'm going to use this tool uh, to bore out the bottom. The cap part is pretty easy it just has to be 25 mils. As I mentioned I'm going to skip these recesses uh, and uh, just epoxy it in place. So let's carry on. Here I'm just marking the centers so that I can punch and countersink them. So because this wood is so hard, I like to set the drive center first so that I can be sure that I have good purchase on the piece before I put it up in the lathe. So a lot of the tools that I'm using here are actually tools that were made by my father-in-law um, out of old files and I must say they worked quite nicely. So now that we have a rough cylinder, it's time to turn it down to the final outer dimension. Now I'm marking out the head and the body so that I can part them off and start working on the individual pieces.
So the first piece I'm going to work on is the head and I'm going to start out by drilling the 22mm hole that uh, the stopper fixture will be glued into. Now the recess in the cap that will ride over the body is going to be about 44 millimeters and as I don't have a drill bit that size I'm going to have to hog that out with my parting tool. So while I've got it chucked up, I'm going to shape the bottom half of the head. The top half of the head I'm leaving for much later because I'm going to have to switch out the jaws on my chuck for the narrow set so that I can clamp it from the inside of the recess. So now I can get started on the head and I'm going to start by uh, flattening off the ends so that I can start drilling the through holes. Now as I mentioned before, the through hole is going to be 30 millimeters and I did a couple of tests off camera and for some reason if I start off the hole with the 30mm spade bit uh, the bit starts wandering a lot and I get a really inconsistent hole so in this case I started off with a 25mm Forstner bit and then I widened out the hole with the 30mm spade bit Now this part was a little hairy and uh, I was getting a lot of vibrations and I could definitely tell that my machine was not enjoying this. So I thought this was going to be the simplest part because I had a tool that was specifically made for this purpose. I was getting insane amounts of chatter and vibration to the point where I was sure that this piece was just going to blow up, especially where the second step started cutting. It got so bad that I ended up pulling this tool out and then I drilled the smaller of the two holes with a 38mm spade bit and then I came back with this tool to finish the 42mm hole. Now everything I was doing to this piece I was obviously doing to the other piece off camera and uh, purely by accident I figured out what the problem was with this tool. Now when I was doing the other one I drilled the through hole with the 25mm and I forgot to enlarge it with the spade bit to 30mm and that right there solved my problems. You see the leading shaft of this tool is exactly 25mm wide and by having a 25mm through hole in the piece that means that the shaft rides perfectly inside that hole and that prevents a whole lot of the vibrations and chatter. Now I wanted to show this because this is something that I have to pretty much do every single time I turn a piece around because it never runs perfectly true so every single time I've got to adjust it lightly uh, to the point where it runs nice and true. So now I can begin shaping the body and I'm going to start by bringing down the neck of the body so that it fits nicely into that recess in the cap. And once that's done the rest is purely aesthetic and as you can see with this one I'm keeping it pretty simple as this is my first one.
I'm just running some sandpaper down the center just to clean up those ugly edges left by the drilling. Now I can turn the piece around and start working on the bottom edge and as you can see I've wrapped the top edge with some masking tape just to protect it from the jaws. So now I'm going to sand everything that I can um, while I still have the wide jaws on the chuck before I switch over to the narrow jaws so that I can shape the top part of the head. Now I'm running all of the pieces through exactly the same grits. I'm starting with an 80 grit, then moving on to a 120, then a 240 and a 360 and eventually a 400. Okay, so now that all the sanding is done and I don't need the wire jaws anymore, I can switch out the jaws so that I can finish off the head. So after showing my wife my progress, uh, her first impression was they look like penises. So this is me trying to make them look a little bit less like penises. So here I'm moving over to the machine lathe just because I have a lot more control of the speed here. Um, this is something that I actually saw someone else do on a YouTube video, which is coating the inside and the bottom part with some CA glue or super glue. This just makes that bottom edge a little bit more durable as it tends to take a lot of punishment. I'm just spraying some accelerator there just to set the glue a little quicker. And as you can see, some of the glue spread to the outside here, so I'm just going to quickly sand that off. Now oh, this was my first attempt at a finish and uh, I've used this finish on other things before but um, obviously it just doesn't work that well for items on the lathe. This stuff tends to dry pretty quickly and while I was applying it with a rag I could already feel it starting to get tacky. Which left a pretty streaky finish which I wasn't a big fan of. I tried doing the head with a brush hoping that it would turn out better but that ended up applying a whole lot more than I wanted which left an even worse finish. So I ended up sanding everything off again and I decided to go with something that always works well for me which is a clear matte Rust-Oleum spray paint. Now I don't want any spray paint in the actual chamber so I'm cutting these plugs just so that I can block those holes. Now this may not be a very traditional finish for wood products but I've used this on many hardwood projects and I'm always surprised at how well the finish turns out. I gave it about three coats, sanding with scotch brite between each coat. So finally it's time to start assembling. So as I mentioned before, I didn't cut the recesses for these locking tabs, so I'm just cutting them off. I'm also shaving these spines down a bit as it was a bit of a tight fit. Now I've got a really nice tight fit. 
Now I'll do the same to the stopper fixture and then just to be on the safe side I'm going to take a file and file in some grooves into all of these pieces just to give the epoxy something to hold on to. So the shaft was just about 8 millimeters too long so I'm just marking that so that I can cut it off and uh, once that's done I'm just going to move over to the bench grinder just so that I can taper that in so that the stopper fixture can fit over there easily. Okay, there we go guys, it's done and I must say I'm really pleased with how that turned out. I don't know why it's taken me so long to actually get around to doing this project, but I guess it's better late than never. I definitely learned a whole lot during this process and I'm pretty sure that uh, the next set that I make is going to take a whole lot less time than what this one did. So wherever my father-in-law happens to find himself right now, I'm pretty sure that he is pleased that I finally got around to making these. And before the end of this year, I'm hoping that I can make and use every single one of those mechanisms that are left in that box, as I really believe that is what he wanted me to do. So with all that said, once again, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, go ahead and hit that thumbs up button. If you feel the need, go ahead and share it with your friends. That always helps with the old algorithm. As well as any comments or suggestions that you might have, you can go ahead and drop them down below. And as always, till next time, keep making stuff.